please listen carefully. But welcome back to the Focus Target Podcast. Finally trying to finish some things up here at the last second. But, uh, you know, here we are back once again uh, with you for episode 104. Um, today we are going to talk about the Batman. Uh, more specifically, the Christopher Nolan Batman. Uh, I think it's called the Dark Knight Trilogy of Batman Begins. Um the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Rises. Now, likely knowing us and because we have a couple of tangential things to get to, we're not going to do this all in one podcast. We'll probably split it up and kind of do a two-parter because there's a lot to get to. So uh, I'm going to jump right in. With me, as always, it is Van and Shy. Sorry, guys, I almost forgot to introduce you. Not that anybody doubted you were here. But uh, let's jump right into the question of the day. We have a question of the day. Last time we had our Final Fantasy X- Eleven Report uh, Part 2. And so to kind of tie back into that... Um, Here's a question that I've actually been pondering the last couple of days since the latest patch notes. Um, would you regret playing Final Fantasy XI on this private server, Eden, if it were shut down tomorrow? So let's say tomorrow the devs say, hey, you know, we actually can't support this, or we got an injunction from SE, uh, and they say they're putting the kibosh on private servers, uh, so we're done. Would you regret the time that you've invested since, what, June, July-ish, whenever we started the last six months? Uh, you know, I, I don't know how many hours I've put in. I, you know, I should have checked the playtime beforehand to see how much time we're talking here, but I'm sure it's significant. Um, let's start with Van today. Van, do you regret the time you spent? Let's, uh, if you know, we stop playing tomorrow. What would I regret the time we yeah. spent if if it stopped playing tomorrow? Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, there, there's under under no circumstance would I regret. I'd be. I'd be sad if they shut it down, but regret certainly wouldn't describe how I would be feeling because like we've had a lot of awesome times and like what is there to regret? It's it's been a labor of love from the people as far as putting it together. So it's not like there's any monetary value that's that's going away immediately. Um yeah, we haven't but, paid for it either. That yeah. it's not like we've sunk a lot of money right. into it. So our <laughs> only our only our only sunk cost is time and we've done podcasts on what the value of that is and it's hard to measure right De- depending on the i guess the instance and what you get out of it but um no it's been great it's been fun and if they set it down i would say like you know what it really sucks that they shut it down but damn that was fun now uh let's go play retail if <laughs> um if they if they do the latter in your example which was oh they got an injunction from se telling them hey you can't do private servers anymore blah blah i would actually be kind of excited because then i'm like hmm are they moving in a direction to where SE is going to host a classic server of their own, which is why they're putting the kibosh on classic servers now? That would be so interesting. Might be less. Yeah. Might be oh. less. Uh, the WoW classic about that one. Maybe yeah. that's we even a better. That. Yeah. Sorry. No. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a tangential question, right? Yeah. If and and I'll I'll go ahead and ask it right now to you, Van, before we go over to Shy. Um, you know, let's say Eden exists, but tomorrow they do announce FFXI Classic. Straight from SE, same. So let's, let's for the for the sake yeah, of the argument, same, they, same, right. same window. We're just gonna go through Ad Ergen. We promise we're not going any further than that, or whatever. Yeah. What do you say to that now? Especially are, are now, NMs, you know? are NMs rare X? No, uh, uh, <laughs> no, they made that change. Uh, they, that was wings, right? They probably have the RMT update. Let's let's assume they <laughs> okay. have. Okay. Um, let's, let's assume it looks pretty much like like Eden looks today. Yeah, I would I would transfer. To, I would transfer yesterday. You would you you would start all so over brand again. Brand new official paying for twelve dollars. Well, why month. am I asking yep. you that? Of course <laughs> you would. Of course, you <laughs> like it's like a good time. I would pay for you <laughs> guys for your first month to start with me. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Because that. Yeah. That's another another layer to it, right? Is you have to. Yeah. You certainly there'd be a monetary component to that instead of playing for free yeah. on Eden. You'd have a, a assuming a, a sub. I think the WoW sub was like you got the retail. You got like yeah, you wow retail, class along with the retail, so you'd get read to the mm-hmm. retail. All right, Sean, let's nice. go to you. First question of: Do you regret FFXI <laughs> if if Eden shut down tomorrow? I wouldn't. I mean, I put a ton, a ton of time more than I'd like to uh, admit. Um, Probably more than but any of us. I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't regret. And what's on maybe another tangential question is: This made me think of what would I, what would have, made, what would make me regret? Like, what would I have done in game that would make me regret? It? And I think honestly, like. That's one reason why I think I've been holding off on like joining an endgame link shell or like working on maybe like really hard like long term projects because I think like if you start working on a relic weapon or like you started on something like really 
long term and then all of a sudden they shut it down and be like wow like i'm halfway through a mythic weapon you know let's say salvage drops and you're like three months into farming like, and you're like and you shut it down um yeah so the second question about square enix um yeah i would i would join uh a square would. Enix hosted classic server and honestly like i know this you won't you guys won't agree with this but if it was like a wings of the goddess server i would be even much more inclined like i realized just I'd be okay ha having started with wings of the goddess how much i miss about wings of the goddess like obviously I think the game was still very solid at that point. I know it wasn't what it is in Eden, but you know it was a lot oh, better. But they than... had books then too, though, huh? That, that yeah, they had the books. The book. They had the mm. level sync in the it's past. So like, yeah, that's when we used to level sync down to Calibri. I mean, like, there's some stuff that like, I don't yeah, know. Um, yeah, uh, you know what they did in WoW, and I'll, obviously we're obviously pie in the sky here. But if they followed the WoW model, what they did in WoW is they said, okay, it would be essentially like this: we're going to release it with Rise of the Zillard mm. only right or whatever hmm. and then after a, a set time that you know like in six months you can expect cop is going to drop and six months after that treasures of adergan is going to drop and six months after that wings of the goddess is going to drop and now now where do they stop how yeah. far they go how long of a time period is is there really those are obviously questions that would impact you know what how, probably how we feel about it right but yeah, I mean, it'd be an interesting. It'd be interesting to see how that was, and having that foreknowledge too would be interesting. Like, if you know that like Wings of the Goddess is coming out in, you know, a couple months, does that change how hard you go after certain items or certain end game events or certain whatever? Like, when you're like, well, I, you know, I know I'm gonna, if this is gonna be easier or or whatever. I, I don't know. Um, to answer the questions myself, I don't regret playing so far. Um, Honestly, I feel like every time they release a, a new update, it makes me like the server less and less. Like, it's very disappointing. And it's it's like, it, it does. Like, little things, like, I don't feel nearly as strong about, like, this new um, change to the Emperor, the Emperor Band and Empress Bands that they just released this week, as I did, like, the NM changes. But it's just another little thing that it's like, it makes it harder for me. It makes like now I can't get as much EXP. Now I now I have to either commit more time, which I don't have, or you know just say, well, okay, my my progress is now is going to be slower. And I just don't. Again, I don't really see the reason why. Like, I get that they're making in era changes, but like it's been like this for the whole length of the game. Why why are you just like slapping people in the face who don't have a lot of time to play? So, I I don't regret the time I've spent, but. I, every time every time they make an update i'm like gosh what's the next update gonna bring and is it gonna make me not want to play at all like it makes me nervous and like to the secondary question i'm honestly <laughs> i i'm i think if you had asked me this pre-eden i would have been 100 percent the opposite way but i don't know that i would join an se classic server to be perfectly honest i probably would if you guys were just because like Am I really going to be left out of Final Fantasy XI? No, of course not. But, like, I would feel a lot more nervous about it. Because that, like, the people who are doing Eden are doing it out of a, a, a love for the game. And, like, there's nothing keeping them doing it for the love. But I think that's different than when there's nothing keeping you doing it except for the money. And, like, if SE does this classic server, they're only going to do it as long as it's profitable. And, like, if they don't, get the money that you know if it doesn't end up panning out the way they hope it does like i i think that's a much a much less stable future than even a private server like eden as crazy as that sounds like like as soon as it's not profitable they have no impetus to do it and like they're a business who has financial considerations where these people are doing it because they want to and even if they stop wanting to they could still potentially pass on the responsibilities to other people who did so I would be a little bit nervous investing a lot of time and now money as well into a private server that, or not a private server, into a uh, Classic FFXI server. Classic that, that I feel like I'd always be like constantly like, are they making enough money? Is there enough coming in? Are they going to decide next quarter that, oh, you know what? We don't have the money for this anymore and the server's going down. Sorry about your progress. I I don't know. I would I would be nervous. See, I wonder though, like if you think it'd be interesting to know how many hundreds of players right now are playing on in private servers right now, whether it's Wings, whether it's Eden, whether it's like these other ones. And yeah, then, well, and then like you think of like how, how much would it cost Square Enix to spin up 
a classic server for maybe several thousand people with content that's already been created. Like they're not paying someone to create content. It's just you're hosting a server. And if they're paying monthly, if you have a couple thousand people paying a monthly sub, like I can only think that's some profit, but maybe not. I mean, yeah, maybe that's, I'm... That's, the whole, that's the basic idea behind WoW Classic, right? It's like yeah. this costs them nothing and it made them a bunch of extra money. And yeah. that's why I could see it actually happening. I could certainly see SC looking at it and be like, dude, we could totally do this and just make a quick buck and like, but I, I just don't know. I would, I'd be, I'd be a lot more nervous about that for, for whatever reason. Maybe that's what, unfounded. But <laughs> what about this? Another tangential? Because technically, this podcast now is just, uh, would you play Final Fantasy XI? <laughs> it's <a> classic. But <laughs> what if, part three. what if, what if FXI <laughs> Classic Remastered came out? Would that, would that bump it up? Oh. I know you guys maybe don't care so much yeah. about graphics, you know. But if it was basically just... cl- classic, but with better, like they improved like graphics and like, you know. I don't know. That would, like that would really, that would, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't, wouldn't make really a make a difference to me. Right. Like I would like it. I'd be like, cool. Like that's awesome. Well, I, let's take advantage of this new computer I have that what is if, a twenty-year-old game. <laughs> what if they remade Final Fantasy XI like they remade Final Fantasy VII and turned it into an action <laughs> MMORPG? Action MMO. <laughs> that would be insane. But I would absolutely not play I, at all. Whatsoever. I don't know. I don't know. You might though. If they did it well, you might. Be interesting to see what it would be like. Would be like, but like yeah. imagine how much more fun grinding EXP parties would be if like the combat was a lot more engaging. Like Terra. Like, imagine if, Terra if, combat. Like Terra, but yeah, in FXI. I, I don't know. I don't know if that'd be good or not. It it would certainly be worth a, a look, I think. All right. Gentlemen, thank you for take going on a question today, Tangent. We got a lot of it. Rabbit hole. If you were not here for FFXI, you got excited that it wasn't an FX, uh, FFXI report. I'm sorry about how much time we spent on it. But personally, I'm not sorry to talk about FFXI. Before we even get to Batman, which we do want to talk about for at least a couple of minutes. You have a podcast, right? Um, we're going to talk about you know, a primary topic. Uh, you know, we wanted to do, you know, we wanted to kind of, since it's the middle of the NHL season, we thought, you know, we, we're only doing a podcast every other week. Instead of taking a full podcast to do, you know, at every, you know, if we do a Final Fantasy 11 update and an NHL update, we're kind of never doing any other topic. So we're going to try and squeeze in a little bit of hockey talk in each podcast as well. Just kind of give an update on how the teams are doing. Um, I'm going to start with the newest team, the Kraken. Um, that would be shy. Shy. How's your team? What's going on? Yeah. Seattle land. So uh, they had a really rough start to the season, especially considering the last expansion team, the Vegas golden Knights. Um, we were look. I, I wish I had the exact stats. I think we were like three, 12 and one i think maybe or something like that and yeah <laughs> not good um so maybe it was 4 12 and one so right now we're 8 13 and one i believe is the exact record we've won four of our last five um that was we in the four game stretch we played the carolina hurricanes we played the tampa Bay lightning we played the florida panthers and we played the washington capitals which i think are basically four of the best teams in the nhl right now and we actually won three of those games the team we lost to was the tampa bay lightning so things are i would say are starting to look up for the kraken i think that there it of, seems like they're getting some stuff together um as of today all of those teams are currently in the playoffs you said washington carolina florida tampa bay and florida tampa bay yeah those are they're <laughs> one and two in the Metropolitan and two and three in the Atlantic. So yeah, they're yeah. four of the six best teams. Four of the four of the five best teams, honestly, in the East. So Yeah. So we so we went impressive. like yeah, the first quarter of the you know, the first like twelve games, we lost to some of the most trash teams in the NHL, like Arizona and Chicago and whatever, and then we decided to start picking it up. So I don't know. We'll see. I'm uh it's been a lot of fun watching them. Their power play is getting a lot better. It was like it was the worst in NHL for the first like twelve games and now it's like middle of the road. I think we're up to like 19 percent 18 or 19 percent power play um and drieger seems like drieger's been goaltending pretty well the last couple games and so maybe he's given group hour a break so yeah there's my quick update um they're looking they're looking a little bit better man what about you what's going on in the land of the golden knight i don't think they were the worst in the nhl in power play i think that award went to the golden knights no we took it from the golden knights for at least a couple games oh jesus yeah yeah <laughs> we were worse than you guys for it's a little bit not uh not one that we want um things are looking up for the knights of gold um they're playing over 500 hockey uh quite substantially for the past 
15, 12 games. They uh, started out kind of poor also, but they've since got their stuff together. I mean, they were riddled with injuries and, you know, Leonard, I guess, was just getting used to being a full-time goalie, um, playing every single game and whatnot, but they're starting to look good. And um, fun fact is they're one point behind the um, Anaheim Ducks and we actually play the Anaheim Ducks tomorrow. And I'm going to that game with none other than Bentendo. Nice. So I will be at oh, that nice. game tomorrow night. Nice. So, so yeah, if they win, they basically jump them and are essentially in the playoffs right now. They're, well, technically, right now, the Avs and yeah. the Gold Knights are the two wildcard teams, one and two in right. the wildcard. But you jump mm-hmm. into the Pacific, the Pacific uh, race. Yep. So that'll be fun. So I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. Nice. Nice. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Um, Avs are doing a lot better as well. They're seven, two, and one in their last ten. Um, they have been beaten up on some crappy teams. Um, is like the Kraken. The, uh, they beat <laughs> yeah, they, they beat Seattle. They played Vancouver a couple times, who are not having a good season. They played Ottawa and barely beat them. Uh, they did beat Anaheim, who's having a better year. But I think Anaheim started really well, and they, like they're still doing all right. But um, you know, they weren't in anticipated to be that good of a team this year and, and are so uh other thing about the abs for whatever reason their schedule has been really wonky and they've had like a lot of like three four five days off in between games early on so they've actually played two to three games less than everybody else in the conference so like if you look at them in the standings they've got 20 uh 23 points but they've got three games at hand and almost against almost everybody who's above them so if they go on to win those three games, they basically jump everybody and are right at the top of the division. Um, if they don't win those games, then obviously they're still in not terrible shape. They're kind of fighting with Vegas for the wild card. I fully expect Las Vegas and Colorado both to to rise to the top before the season's over, at least, you know, top one or two in the in their respective divisions. Uh, Seattle, I'm not so sure about, but, you know, I mean, those are quality wins against good teams. And if they get... They get going. I do think some of the teams in the Pacific maybe that started really good, um, like, you know, are kind of falling down to earth a little bit. San Jose's already come down. I wonder if Anaheim might as well. I don't know what's going on with Calgary. Calgary has started really good, too. And, like, yeah, they seem to be for real. I haven't actually seen much of them. Calgary and Edmonton have all seemed like they're doing really well. Edmonton, I think, was supposed to be pretty good. Calgary, right. I think, is a little bit of a surprise. But... But yeah, so that's what's up. The good thing for the Avs is they get McKinnon back. Uh, I believe he's expected to play tomorrow against Toronto. So we just okay. lost Carlson again last week. I was oh, gonna really? say after yeah, having what, him back for two weeks. What is Patrick? Yeah. Do you have is Stone not? Is it Stone back? Who's back? Yeah, he's back. What about Patrick? Still- We're almost back. We're almost back full. I think Alec <clears throat> Martinez and Carlson are on the IR, but I think we got the rest of the team back. Patrick back. I but said, so. and, and certainly not um Eichel. Certainly well, not, not Eichel. Eichel. Yeah, no. Okay. Do they have they well, have I mean, a, he, he, was, yeah. he hasn't been, ever been on the team. Well, yeah, <laughs> you know <what> I mean. <laughs> like he had to be on the team for him to come back. <laughs> or at least play for him to come back. Fair enough. All right, well, so that's our NHL update. Uh we will probably continue to do that from podcast to podcast just kind of keep tabs on where where the teams are in the season as as it goes along, but I mean, we're Getting to about the quarter point of the season, most teams have played kind of 20 to 20, 22 games, which is the one quarter mark. So um, just moving right along. NHL season always goes fast, as, as as many games as there are. I feel like it's always over so quickly. Um, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, all right. Batman, Dark Knight Trilogy. Let's start at the beginning where Batman begins. So let's go, if it's all right with you guys, let's go through today and talk. We'll kind of give our kind of high level thoughts. We're not going to do a, a breakdown of the plot of each movies. If you haven't seen these movies, please just go watch them. In fact, if you haven't seen the Batman, the whole, the trilogy, you should stop this podcast right now. It's a really quality trilogy. Definitely worth your time. Definitely worth watching. Don't have it spoiled by us. Yipping yeah. and yapping about it, like go watch it, enjoy it, and then come back and listen to this. It's it's worth it like eight and a half hours of uh, film. Yeah, it's quite. It's a, close I mean, to yeah, that. they're all yeah. they're all like two, two, yeah. two to three hours each, right? Yeah, I will say too, if you have uh, HBO Max, they were all on HBO Max, and that's how I was able to mm-hmm. to watch back through them. So um, there you go. I have the I have the three disc 
DVD collection. So that's nice. all mm-hmm. not the Blu-ray, but the DVD. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sarah and I are DVD people. We're not. We're not so much Blu-ray people. Mm. I don't know why. We just we're we're kind Sad. of school. Yeah, we're we're fossils. But um, yeah. So let's so let's go <laughs> let's go through each, each each movie. We can kind of just talk kind of high level what we thought about things we liked, things we didn't, and then maybe probably next episode we'll kind of like look at the trilogy as a whole. Maybe kind of go through um kind of like the character maybe a little bit more into the characters but like let's talk about just kind of the movies and the famous favorite scenes and things you like things you did so let's start with batman begins um what you know what are your thoughts on, i'm gonna start a little bit like i remember when i first saw this movie i thought um how cool it was to have batman basically like trained as a ninja you know like i thought that was just like a really cool like and i don't know if that was a comic book thing you know i i am not familiar with the comic book lore of Batman. I haven't read any comics or anything. So maybe that's something that everybody already knew, but like, I didn't realize that. Like I knew he was like a crime fighting and gadgets, but like I didn't, I thought like it was cool how he gets trained into this league of shadows. And like, he's already kind of a badass. Like you can tell that from the first scene where he's just beating up a whole gang of inmates, but like to actually be trained, like with all these techniques kind of, Shows why, like, I like that there's a foundation for, like, why is he able to, like, beat up all these thugs throughout these movies with such ease? It's like he's basically a trained assassin. So I thought that was a badass way to start the movie and kind of set a foundation for, like, how his, he's able to handle his crime fighting physically. Um, let's go to Shy. Shy, what, uh, what are your thoughts on Batman well, Begins? To, uh, an hour of, I mean, I have lots of thoughts, <laughs> but um, I think to, to piggyback off that, I mean, I really liked how right off the bat when he's doing the training and he's working with Ra's al Ghul, there's that introduction of the idea of Batman as an ideal and not just as a vigilante. And I think that like, that's an undercurrent throughout the trilogy. And I think that's like, that really makes these movies stand out from like this, like huge, like subgenre nowadays of vigilante films where it's just basically like angry men, like beating up or killing you know, bad guys. And like Batman's not that, you know, he's something more. And I think that that was cool that like that distinction was made. Indeed. Van, what's your opening thought? Yeah, kind of similar to how you all mentioned it. I never read really the Batman comics or anything like that. So whether him being trained an assassin or whatnot was canon, it was pretty cool to actually be there at the origin of Batman as opposed to just jumping into the other films where he already has his superpowers. And I use superpowers terms loosely because he doesn't really have like superpowers or mutations or anything like that. He's just a normal civilian who has been trained and has a lot of technology and money behind him. Money is a superpower. Yeah, (laughs) right, sure. Fair enough. Yeah. (laughs) To pull a and line, yeah. Playboy. yeah. To pull a line from the newer like DC movies, there's a scene where like the Flash looks at Batman like in like a Justice League, like uh, the Zack Snyder Justice League. He's like, "What's your superpower?" And he's like, "I'm rich." <laughs> like Ben Affleck's Batman <laughs> says that. So uh, yeah. appropriate. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, it was pretty cool to pretty cool to see. All right, good, very good. Um, you know, as that movie went on, and it kind of. You know, it really did, like like you said, I thought that was cool that a lot of movies do kind of, especially Batman movies, the previous Batman movies I'd seen, like Batman and Batman Returns, Batman and Robin, stuff like that. Like, you know, his past was discussed a little bit, but like this one really starts starts at it, you know, like right, basically right after things get going, you kind of get the whole scene with him falling into the well. Like, I know that's a very traditional Batman thing so like i it seems like it's really still rooted in in a lot of like what you know to be batman um stuff like what did you think about um you know how like did it come off as cheesy to you at all like there's a lot of kind of emotional moments like when when the dad like when they're you know when after the play when his parents get shot and stuff like that like how do you think they handled that those kind of like kind of heavier moments that those kind of dramatic moments i didn't personally i didn't feel like they were like overdone or too cheesy but no you guys uh, so i'll go to van any any thoughts <clears throat> no i i think it was done fine i, I will say from like the old uh, was it michael keaton batman or something like that that's one of the, like the scenes that I remember most is is dropping the flowers and the parents dying and all that stuff. And it was um, super impactful from my childhood when I first saw them. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I think I think they did a swell job. And I, I think knowing that this is going to be a trilogy as opposed to just a one and done movie 
really allowed him to slow the character development and really get into the niches of what happened and, and, and all that stuff. And I think that's where if you're committed to go along for the ride for its entirety, it's going to pay off because you get the character development to where it becomes meaningful. You start to get a relationship with them, with the characters themselves, as opposed to just seeing somebody on the screen. So, yeah, I think they, I think the, the pace was well and the, the tone was well also. Shy? No, I mean, I think I thought the scene in the alley when the when his parents get shot, I thought was extremely well done and realistic. Like the whole idea that like it was his dad, like like the guy moves the gun towards the wife and the dad like kind of reacts, you know, like just because yeah. it was moved, like it's that defensive. And then like because he did that, the criminal just like pulls the trigger because he moved quickly. And like it just felt like very human. Like these are like the kind of chain of events that cause shootings like in the street. And like, um, I don't know, like just, you know, Van talked about in the past. Once again, going to the more modern Bat, uh, Batman film. So Batman vs Superman, Zack Snyder's version of his parents getting shot is so overly overly stylized. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but like, there's a scene where like the cop is holding the pistol to like his mom's like chest basically, and her pearl necklace has like somehow gotten caught over the back hammer of the gun. So when he pulls the trigger, it like cocks back and breaks the pearl necklace and a pearl like it's just like over the top you know and like i think like that is like the bouncing pearls yeah yeah that's like a disconnect for me basically (laughs) versus like what what how it's shown in this um i think what i would say is and if we could maybe segue to the next the next point or like next thought is just in this first movie i made several notes about the cast and just what an incredible cast they were able to assemble and i think talking about like like poignancy I think his relation, Bat, um, Batman's relationship with uh, Albert Alfred. I think oh, Alfred. Um, Morgan, uh, not Morgan Freeman, uh, Michael Caine's Michael Caine. character. Like, I don't know. Just throughout, and we'll I'm sure get to that later as we talk about other movies. But I just I don't know. I think that is that was very impactful for me. And by the third movie, like you know, I mean it's very emotional. Some of the interactions they have. <clears throat> I, I mean, I, if you're talking about relationships with characters, and I think we're probably going to go into it at some point. Like I, I think his relationship with Gary Oldman as the Commissioner Gordon was absolutely amazing. Also, I've always loved Gary Oldman, but yeah. he nailed that Commissioner role. Yeah, yeah, he really did. He's very, very iconic Commissioner Gordon, right? Uh, Detective Gordon, I guess, in this particular film. But sure, uh, yeah, you're right. But yeah, like he 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 did yeah, he did a great job with that. Um, I, yeah, I thought. Um, I guess I want to get into that a little bit too. One of his other relationships, the one that he has with Rachel, right? His, his childhood, childhood friend, Rachel, and how, you know, like you said that they kind of set it up for a larger trilogy rather than just a, a whole thing. I remember the first time I saw it, I found it really refreshing to me that like the love interest didn't work out. Which I guess that's actually more typical as to superhero movies. Usually, you know, I guess maybe in superhero movies it is more like, no, we can't be together because I, <laughs> you know, I've got my duty to the streets or whatever. What voice is that? So that was my bad. <laughs> oh, that was my bad. Uh, <laughs> did you not like it? it wasn't was that Bane or <laughs> was that Bane? Have you heard Bane? That that like, wasn't Bane. No, oh, Lee, it wasn't that bad, was it? Uh, try, <laughs> try to be a little gravelier next there you time. Go. No, that's nailed it. There you go. That's it. That's what we needed. But, um, you know, like, I, I liked it. Like, I, I thought it was cool that it didn't just work out for them in the end. Like, there's obviously this love this love interest and this love connection. And, like, in the end, she's like, you know, maybe one day when the city doesn't need Batman anymore, maybe we can figure something out, you know. Um, and obviously that has rolls into the second movie. But um, I thought that was a cool, a cool thing. I actually, to jump a little bit ahead. So, you know, they cast Katie Holmes for Rachel in this first one. And then they had a different actress as Rachel in the second one. Which one did you guys like better? Did you have a preference? I mean, I, I, I think Rachel got more airtime in the second one, right? So just sort of. as a character, I think there's... You see more of her. There's a little more depth, as opposed to just this budding defense attorney in the first one. I don't. I don't know. I. 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 I, I really didn't care oh. either one. Shy, do you have an opinion? No, yeah, I mean, I like. I mean, that's. I don't know if you guys know. That's Jake Gyllenhaal's sister. Is the is the Rachel from the second one? Um, Maggie Gyllenhaal. So I'm. I'm a fan of her in general. So I. I liked her more in the second one. 
I did Do we know well. why they changed her? Yeah, it was a scheduling conflict. Uh, Katie Holmes wasn't available to do the second. I don't movie. like when they do that. I don't either. It's sad. Like I feel like if you're gonna make a trilogy and like you know it's gonna be a trilogy from the beginning, like like why imagine, not imagine like, if they changed the Lego Yeah, like exactly. for, you know, or like Harry Potter. Yeah. Okay, well, a side character. Fine, Ron Weasley. What if they changed Ron Weasley for like? The last three episodes. And they got well, lucky with we, Harry Potter, because with Lord of the Rings, they filmed them at the same time. And that's that's yeah, the way to do it if you know you're going to do yeah, a trilogy. Right. Just shoot them all at once, and yeah. then, I mean, that doesn't happen. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, we see, we do see it happen in a lot of things where, like, like the Oracle got changed. Dumbledore gets changed in Harry Potter. And, like, because those are... died. That wasn't her fault. Yeah. Right. No, exactly. Well, what I mean. She have a scheduling conflict. She's no longer on Earth. I understand that. Like, we, we, <laughs> we know that it sucks when it happens... Uh, for things outside of your control like it's right. even worse yeah. when it's like oh well they couldn't get the schedule to work and it's like yeah. you know like yeah. you, it's something you may have to deal with anyway like i feel like they should try to minimize it but star wars started using cgi faces i mean <laughs> oh let's not go there what if luke skywalker had been different <laughs> in the second and third one like <laughs> <laughs> what if they used a different r2 unit <laughs> they did what if they brought in r4 to replace r2 like they, Chris Nolan releases a Dark Knight like director's version where they've taken Katie Holmes' face and put it on Maggie John Hall's face for the, for the Dark Knight. Mm-hmm. And then Hester, because I Miley, you need to get a, right. you need to get, get control of your podcast here. Yeah, no, we're going a little bit off the rails, but you know what? We're it's been one of those podcasts already, so that's fine. Um, yeah. All right, well, so what what else you guys got? Uh, should we talk about Liam Neeson? Hmm. Raza Ghoul, like I thought Talk he was so good. Cast. Like I thought he was I so just, good. In this. Yeah, I just want to name some of the cast here, right? So we got Christian yep. Bale's Batman, mm-hmm. Michael Caine as Alfred, Gary Oldman as Commissioner. We've mentioned all mm-hmm. these so far. Morgan Freeman as Lucius, yeah, like the scientist. Katie Holmes, yep. Liam Neeson, yep. and then we haven't even gotten to the next ones. You know, Heath Ledger, Anne well, Hathaway. I mean, <laughs> well, staying Batman Begins because Ken Watanabe is the fake Razagul. Like yeah. he gets like uh, yeah. five minutes in the film oh, and he's right. like an awesome actor. It's just so yeah, like yeah. it's yeah, so fun. I don't know. Fake Razagul. <laughs> the, the decoy. Like Razagul. how cool. Yeah the decoy. Like, yeah, sure. There's so many cool things about that training scene. The scene when they're fighting on the ice, the scene his final test when he gets nicked in the shoulder by the blade and then he like nicks someone else and hides and like it's just yeah. the whole like trick of like, you know, the the fake Razagul, the decoy. Like, I mean just there's so much just good elements. yeah it, like it's funny because like i don't know like i guess i didn't really get it the first time i watched it like because i didn't realize that Ra's al ghul wasn't liam neeson from the beginning like i thought that <laughs> mm. it was just like some other guy like, uh, i thought he was always Ra's al ghul. Like a wise then re- master to be yeah there. then when i rewatched, i was like oh they did a bait and switch there and i i just missed it <laughs> <laughs> you're too smart you're too smart for the, yeah, the screenwriting yeah. smiling maybe maybe that's what it is i don't know but uh yeah and you know i i should give a shout out to michael kane michael kane one of my very favorite actors uh ever since i saw him as ebenezer scrooge in a muppet christmas carol which is the best christmas movie ever in my book um that's off to mr kane i think he's such a great alfred i mean he really he really nails that role too awesome. like just yeah from the beginning to the end um all right uh what what else you guys want to talk about from batman begins anything anything as far as like favorite scenes things maybe things you didn't like about as much or that could have been better i uh, yeah i have a, I've, I've, i have a thing that i think could be better and i think Wait. that that kind of rears its ugly head in this movie that continues at least through the next film and that is christopher okay. nolan's complete ineptitude in directing extended fight scenes and so like right off the bat in batman begins in the prison he starts in a prison he starts fighting like he fights these like four guys and like and like, like it's seen later in the movie, like when they're uh, when he's trying to stop that the tram with the with the microwave device, and he fights those like four ninjas. And like yeah. Christopher Nolan, I I don't know if he's purposely trying to make it feel like close combat is chaotic, especially when multiple combatants are involved. But like it is not clean or well edited at all. Like if you watch like a good like Jet Li or Jackie Chan fight scene, and then you watch Christopher Nolan fight scenes, like they are they're horrible. There's no continuity or whatever. And so like, I, I hate, I hate his fight scenes. And I, I want to talk like, as we get further in the trilogy, I'll talk about some other stuff like that. Cause I think he does some really cool stuff, especially in the third movie where he gets away from, from that. But just, I've, I've never liked the fight scenes in Batman begins. And like it, I think just watching him again this time, the length of time that the fight scenes go on for. 
oh not no necessarily the the camera angles and all that stuff too because they are pretty long they're pretty drawn out they're they go on for quite a while yeah i one of my favorite movies is the legend of drunken master with jackie chan and the fight scenes in that movie are oh, okay. like four or five funny. minutes like yeah the whole yeah. movie's a fight scene basically <laughs> i love fights I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fight scene connoisseur so yeah what about you van do you have any any like parts you didn't like as much or things that slowed down for you no not really i don't have any i'm not too critical of the first one everything seemed pretty on par and pretty good pretty well done the only the only thing i didn't like and i wouldn't even go as far as say i didn't like it but like i'm a little underwhelmed about the way raz al ghul goes down like i mean i i get it like batman's like you know i don't have to i'm not gonna kill you oh sorry i'm not gonna kill you <laughs> all right I oh, doesn't mean I can save you either, you know, or whatever. I don't think that was. I don't think I was better. I think I lost the graveliness a little bit, but whatever. <laughs> you get the point, right? Like he needs to be more airy and less volumey, less voicey. Yeah, um, like, I just felt like Ra's al Ghul is like such a badass, and then it's just like he almost kind of has like an off-camera death in a way. It's like Batman leaves, and like you just assume that he gets blown up in the train crash, and it's just hmm. like I don't know. I guess I would have wanted something a little bit more showdowny, a little bit more climactic. But does he die? Because he always said he was immortal. I mean, he obviously comes back as a ghost, like as a force ghost. Um, yeah, like which, a vision, which is weird. Yeah. It's weird that he it's weird that Raz that he can come back as Raz al Ghul as a force ghost. Yeah, we never see Qui Gon Jinn come back as a mm, force ghost. It's just mm, like handled off screen. And one. maybe I want to see that in the new Obi Wan series, but mm. like maybe that'll be like the real like super secret surprise like the way they kept luke skywalker a surprise for mandalorian like there's been no tie of liam neeson to to the new and they already they already brought back freaking darth uh the hell's his name darth maul Darth Maul. yeah they already brought back darth maul because apparently when his body got singed it cauterized his lower half so he didn't die he didn't bleed out which is funny because that was that was actually canon in the in like the pre Disney takeover Mm -hmm. and then it was wiped out. And then they're like, yeah, but we're going to keep that. And then they brought (laughs) it in. They brought it into the new canon too. Like, but that's a, that's a different topic altogether. Do a Star Wars podcast. Uh, Oh dear. I don't think we could fill a podcast on Star Wars. (laughs) Um, anyway, any, any final thoughts on Batman begins or should we go to, to I thought it was a great setup for what ended up being an absolute masterful trilogy. Yeah, yeah. I you like I shy final yeah. thought like yeah final another grade. just one more thing. I mean yeah. I would I mean I'd give it an A. I mean A plus in general as far as the movies go, a solid A. Um, I think one last comment I was gonna make was just the films get a rep I think of being a, a very serious, right? Like a very serious telling of Batman. But I like that Christopher Nolan can fit in like some humor, some like light humor yeah. occasionally without like the cheesy, like Joss Whedon jokes from like the Marvel series or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or like, like one note that I took was the scene when like he shows up first in a Batmobile and the police dispatcher is trying to like, the police officer is trying to describe what it is. He's like, and I've heard that the quote, he's like, he's in a vehicle, a uh, black tank. <laughs> like he's like yeah. trying to think of like how to describe <laughs> it. And like, it's just funny. Like, you know, and just like, there's like yeah. just smattered throughout him. And I think obviously the second one maybe isn't, doesn't have as much of that, but like he tries to fit that in occasionally. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think the humor's the humor is pretty good. Wait, you don't find the Joker funny in the second one. Oh my gosh. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, jokes on you. Well, all right, let's let's move on then. Uh, while Why we saw so serious? On. Why so serious, Shy? <laughs> um, let's move on to the second one, The Dark Knight. I think. Do I speak for everybody when I say that this is your guys' favorite of the three? Ooh, Shy's got to think about it. Van, nice. you, I'm getting on like Van. It. it is. It is absolutely my favorite. I would go as far as to call it an absolute masterpiece. I just absolutely loved. It's a brilliant. The Dark it's, a, it's, just, it's a brilliant. It's, one. it's an absolutely amazing piece of uh i would uh, yeah i'm not gonna go like as high as id4 as far as amazing but well, it, it is, hold it, on it now. Is, let's not get it crazy is here <laughs> it is it is masterfully done it's it's yeah. a it's a yeah it's it's well, take it's us through, while, while you're going take us through it like what are what why like what what I, put I, it so high what is it about it that's so great i think it has a mix uh i mean it it basically pulls you completely all around the emotional spectrum on in every way possible from like the the good feel goods 
to like the most uncomfortable positions through Heath Ledger's absolutely stunning portrayal of the Joker, which he just completely embodied 100%. You had you you had no choice but to le- believe he thought he was the Joker at that time. Like it is just absolutely incredible. And yeah, it's 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 great. Great stuff. Shy? I think The Dark Knight is one of the best movies I've ever seen on its own. In yeah. the trilogy, the more I watch The Dark Knight Rises, the more I like it in as in, really? in, as part of the trilogy because it wraps up so much. And so I think it has it has come to equal Dark Knight, if not even a little bit more within like within a trilogy. But I think The Dark Knight is 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 one of the best movies I've ever seen. And I think because for what a two and a half hour movie or two hour two hour and three quarter hour movie, that movie doesn't slow down and it's not like it's rushed like nothing about it is yeah. boring everything's interesting i think christopher nolan's camera work his storytelling the cinematography everything is just so well done and everything is there's so many cool concepts and i'm sure we'll talk about some specific scenes or whatever but there's like a lot of the technology stuff that like lucius comes up for him and stuff like that like there's just so many unique ideas presented in that film and yeah <clears throat> and the yeah, joker's awesome I think, yeah I, I think so yeah i think the way the joker um like I think that that's what really gets me on it is is his oh. his, his his uh like technical plan like the way he has these like machinations and like they always <laughs> kind of come out exactly right you know it's like and but it doesn't feel like a deuce ex machina type of thing or like mm. you know a lot of times when you have these master plans where everything like mm. everything kind of has to go a certain way for it to work out and like it's fun in the moment but then you go back and think about it and you're like well, you know, but what are the chances of it really actually, like, if one of these things, completely random things had gone differently, none of this would have worked. And, like, it see, it came off really cool, but, like, this is like a one in a million, like, fluke more than, like, that's just kind of disguised as a master plan. But I don't get the feeling from that in this particular film. It feels like it's not because he's hoping for random events or for th- chance to take him a certain way it's like the psychology of it which is so interesting to me it's like he's like i know how you're going to react to this and i'm planning for it and then you do and so you kind of fall into my trap like that's that's where i i I walked away from it just like being finding it really compelling you seem like you want to disagree a little bit shy i do because it's so funny you mention this because the first i've never it's never bothered me i've never been bothered by that idea of like how complicated his plan is by the movie and i've seen the movie a dozen times but this Mm -hmm. plate viewing i was sitting there thinking this could have gone wrong this like was complete chance he was really relying on like timing here and like and just like and i was like this is like it doesn't bother me ultimately because i can suspend disbelief and i just love the movie for what it is but both this and the next movie i feel like his and bane's plots are so complicated that they could be like they could be ruined by like someone not putting you in an interrogation room at a certain time like if you th- or like not putting you in a certain holding cell at a certain time if they put him if they put him in in like uh solitary solitary confinement for like 24 hours instead of in that open air thing whatever like you know if they decide not to interrogate him i don't i mean i don't yeah interesting so maybe i need to watch it again a little bit more critically there because i didn't I feel, feel like still, much chance well, well here, here, here's an example here i just want to give a specific thing and and this is maybe giving some stuff away but like he so batman creates that that telephone network the cell phone network right to find the yeah, joker yeah. at the building and the joker's waiting for him like the Joker's waiting for him to show up, but like, how do you know yeah. that Batman was even developing that technology? Like, he didn't. We have no idea that like he had See, some I kind of like spy he, in the in, in the company or whatever. Like, I wouldn't say he would do that. I, I think he was giving respect to the Batman, saying, "Hey, I know you're smart enough to find out where I am. Therefore, I will set this up like the way he did, right, with the people, the hostages yeah. and, and Joker masks and stuff like that." That yeah. one doesn't bother me either. Yeah, because it's like Batman always shows up. He knows right. Batman's going to show up. But without up, that, he wouldn't he have shown up. Without that technology, that's he wouldn't have shown up. But like, I mean, it doesn't matter how. All, all see, the Joker knows is the Batman always shows up. He always has. He always has. I see yeah. this getting good. It, like we don't, we you know, no, nobody knows how he. That's knows a Deuce Ex Machina. That's like, a Deuce Ex Machina saying the Batman always <laughs> shows up. Like I don't but like like I don't know. If, I don't know. I, I don't think I don't feel like it is. I feel like but it's I like, kind of feel like. And the two faith, like even if he didn't show up, it wouldn't matter because the Joker always had an answer for anything that happened. My my example for that is when he walks into the boardroom with all the other with all the other um, mm-hmm. you know uh, kingpins and all that stuff, and he's in there negotiating with them and saying, "Oh yeah, blah blah, you know, get, what do you, what do you want?" He's like, "Oh, half your money," and 
and all this stuff. And, and he was ready to just, if they agreed, everything was going to be fine, but they didn't agree. Right. So there were two different outcomes. They could have either agreed or they couldn't have. And when they didn't agree, he opens up his jacket pocket. He pulls out his grenades and he says, yeah, you're just going to let me walk out now. Like, I kind of feel like he always had some kind of a plan set up regardless of which way the events unfolded. We're only seeing one turn of event, but had it gone the other way, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to say the Joker would have had a, a a response for it. So let me pitch you another scenario. I'm sorry, this is going to now turn into a like, was this the Joker's yeah, plan or not? So like, so that the awesome chase scene in the streets when they're transferring Harvey Dent and there's that awesome scene with the, the semi where they flip the semi and like, you know, he's in the semi, whatever. So did he know Gordon had faked his own death? Because if Gordon hadn't faked his own death and knocked him out when he had the gun on Batman, like he could have just killed Batman right there. But like all of a sudden Gordon was there and knocked him out. And then later on, and you know, like comes out of the armored van and like, like, so he was apparently relying on Gordon to be alive, to knock him out so he'd get captured so he wouldn't kill Batman. So then he could then, like, face off against Batman later. So, like, it's just, like, these little things, like, I, that... I'm going to agree I'm gonna agree with Van again on this, though, because it's like, you know, is it not possible that what he ha- what we saw was his contingency plan? Like, what if he... What if Gordon's not there? Then he... Maybe he does kill the Batman. That's what he's been paid to do. That's what he's supposed to do. Then he and goes so his and contingency plan bounty. is putting the bomb then, in the guy and like kidnapping yeah. the other people and, and like, like. And again, like I think that's a reasonable thing. It's like I'm going up against Batman. Like, how many criminals have come out on top in this one? Like none. Like I should prepare. Like he's gonna have mm, tricks up his yeah, sleeve. I like I, yeah. I got to be ready in case he gets me. And if he doesn't, if I'm able to win, cool. Like that's what I'm supposed to do. But if I can't, I'm going to have a backup plan. And I think that's what we saw there was his backup plan because of Gordon faking his own death. So not that that's not inconsequential. It's just that he was ready. Like he didn't losing. Isn't the end for him. It's like, okay, if this goes wrong, I'll do something else. I'll go back to that first one. Say same thing for that. Like he's doing his little experiment with the boats, right? If Batman can't find out where he is, then Batman doesn't come to stop him. And he just does what he wants and moves on to the next thing. Like, what has he lost if Batman doesn't foil his plans? Like, right. maybe he's, he's doing a social dead, experiment but, anyways. Yeah. yeah. And then he'll like, yeah. blow up the bolts. Yeah. Like, so I my, think that's part of his chaos that it's like, <clears throat> he's, he's actually okay with a lot of different outcomes. It's not like it has to go exactly one way for him to be happy. He, like, and I kind of feel like that's his attitude where he's just kind of like, eh, okay. <laughs> so my final response would be that too many things go right then, I guess. Like, and it, and, and it feels like too much. It feels like too much for one man to coordinate. Like, I, maybe I'm giving the Joker too little credit, but like, if that is true, if he had like layers upon layers upon layers of redundancy over the course of like six days, like that is a lot of like coordination. And I know he has all these people and he's infiltrated and whatever, but you know, I, I don't know. Like I really, uh, yeah, maybe I, I'm, just I'm not, not, I'm not trying to say you don't have a leg to stand on. You, no. you probably do. But like it didn't come off to me as much in a lot of movies as it in this one. There's like this one I felt like he's using their psychology against him. It's like a lot of times he's in the right place at the right time because he's analyzed them and he knows how they're gonna react. And like they do do the exact thing he wants. But like it comes back to remember a while back we had that podcast about determination versus free will and the idea that like you make the decision you make because of all these different factors, like it seems like free will, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's that like you would always make the same decision because you have all these things that have brought you to that point. And I feel like there's a little bit of that in the way the Joker operates where it's like, he knows, he knows who these people are and what they're going to do. And so he's ready for it when they do, but I'll, I'll try to watch that one. I mean, it'll be a treat to watch that movie again. So I'll try to watch it again with a little bit more critical of an eye and really try to, see if i give it a fair shake to say like is this reasonable yeah. that this all happened the way it did or how how far-fetched is this and i'll try to report back on that at some point and see if if uh if i kind of come over to your side a little bit but right now i i'm not convinced all right all right, all right couple, what else about this i have, oh, a, couple, yeah, I have a couple i have a couple hot takes about it maybe you guys can, yeah. can give me some uh some feedback on this so i think that the joker is the original john wick if anyone's seen John Wick, there's the famous line, he killed a man with a yeah. pencil. And there's the awesome scene when he puts the pencil in the, I'm going to make this pencil yeah. disappear. And then, bam. And I'm like, John Wick right there. So okay. I was, uh, thought that was awesome. I'm sorry. Like, it's, it's a grotesque humor for sure. Yeah. But there are some funny parts in that movie. But non-gory. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. Like, at least that oh, scene yeah. was, was yeah, yeah. like, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. little squeamish. Mm-hmm. Or like, when he's like, I'm like, 
I'm like a dog chasing a car. I wouldn't know what to do with it if I caught it. <laughs> like yeah. that's a funny line. It's yeah. a good line. <laughs> yeah. There's some dark scenes. I think that like philosophical scenes too. Oh, I don't know if like you guys dark. like the scene when he brings in that guy. The guy wanted to kill him in the boardroom and his like two associates. When and the, well they bring him the dead Joker and he's not dead. He yeah. wakes yes. up. He kills the guy and then he breaks that pool yeah. cue and he's like, and we're recruiting. So we'll take one of you guys, which are once one and tosses this like weapon yep. at them. And then you assume they're one of them kills the other two. Like yeah, fight you know, to guys death, who've yeah. worked together. Like, and I was sitting there like, what would I do? Like, would I try to like, be like, Hey guys, we're going to, we got to like, let's just try to take these goons down. Like, and would, you know, like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's hard to put stuff. yourself. Mm. It's hard to put yourself in that situation. Cause you're not already a criminal. <laughs> you're not already <laughs> working. Yeah. For a, I mean, that's, that's you a know, good point. Like, yeah. You don't have that mindset that maybe they have. <laughs> yeah. Like a little more cutthroat, right? Honor yeah. amongst thieves, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, one, one scene that's always bothered me as much as I love that city chase scene with the semi flip and like, it's just so well done. And I've heard, I heard someone else talk about this, uh, a film reviewer that I watch is that like when he's, he gets, you know, he, he, he blocks that rock, that RPG shot with his Batmobile. And so he has to go into the motor, like the bat bike, which is the first time we see that. Yeah. But, like, as he's going through the city, he's, like, he, there's a scene where he sh- blows up these cars. Like, there's these kids, like, like acting like they're shooting at these cars. And all of a sudden, he fires rockets at these cars. And they blow up. And the kid's, like, ah. You know, it's, like, it's supposed to be kind of funny. Because it's, like, did we just do that? But, like, right. to me, that's always bothered me. Because, like, he doesn't know if there's people. Like, obviously, they're just sitting in a parked car. Like, he, <laughs> did he just kill, like, a dozen people in these cars he just blew up? You know, like, it's just, like, the little thing. That's, I don't know why it's always bothered me. But I've always been, like, it's just, like, his recklessness in that, that scene specifically bothers me. Like, I've never um, it seems a little reckless. Um yeah <clears throat> and i guess just just a, my final thought for the movie and i think that that ties off to the action scenes in batman begins that tower scene at the end the skyscraper scene where he infiltrates and he's doing all the stuff like stopping the swap members whatever i think that is ingenious from an action scene and it's maybe like what van was saying it doesn't involve extended fist fights it's like very much like it's very linear like he's moving from point to yeah. point to point there's a little bit of action in each place and i just i think that is just an incredibly done scene that was pretty cool because he was fighting. Mm-hmm. He was fighting all the Joker assets, and at the same time trying to stop the SWAT from miskilling mm-hmm. hostage Joker assets. And like, yeah, he's going back and forth. Yeah, was, another one of those awesome. really cool ideas, right? Like <clears throat> the the trickiness of putting the putting the hostages in the you know in the in the guard spots and like yeah. just funny things to think about where it's like that. Like it's a cool. Like that's what you want out of a supervillain is those, especially a Joker supervillain is like weird kind of almost zany like plots that you're just like, what is he doing? Like trying to figure out what is he doing? Like, like, I don't know that. I think that's one of the things that really gets sells the movie for me and really makes it feel different than a lot of movies is like stuff where you're like, you're never really sure if what you're seeing is real in, in a lot of ways with, with the Joker. I think it's amazing that we've had this whole conversation about the Dark Knight and haven't mentioned Two Face once, who's like a mm. huge Harvey Dent villain, and yeah, yeah Harvey Dent mm. becomes Two Face and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, very, very cool to see like how they did that. I thought where to mm. actually see his fall from grace, right? To see the steps that pushed him, you know, and, and, and you get course- the super small snippet in the beginning when Batman stops him, right? When he has the gun. And he's about to to pull the trigger and Batman stops. He's like, hey, well, you know, if anybody else saw you doing this, they would lose hope right. in all of humanity and all that stuff. And it's like, maybe right. you were wrong about who Harvey Dent really is inside in his soul. And he's not the golden boy. And, and then sure enough, you see his, his quick fall from grace and who he becomes. And you're like, yep, that was in him all along, I guess. And just suppressed or something. I don't, I don't know. But it no, gives you're a- right. Not all along, but yeah, you I saw don't... the snippet of it earlier. <laughs> I think that, it, was, like, it was good foreshadowing, right? Is yeah. there some foreshadowing is what you're getting at right there? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's an interesting point. I've never viewed it that way. I've always viewed like the dark Knight as a, as a tale of like how evil can corrupt someone, how like how personal <laughs> attachments, how like loss and grief can like destroy your soul. Like not maybe I never thought of him as like that being a part of him entirely, but like at all. And but, maybe like, it wasn't. And that was Joker's, Oh, I don't know, because Joker's whole point was that even your most noble person who you think the yeah. highest of can be evil, can become evil. Like that was yeah. Joker's purpose in turning Harvey Dent into into what he did, into Two Face. Sure, but I think I thought that was what the whole point of that though, and is what you were saying is that like 
that nobody's perfect, right? That nobody's incorruptible. And that even, even someone who like, we, we can agree before he becomes two faced, like Harvey Dent's a good person. Mm-hmm. He's trying to do the right thing, but like, even like nobody, like people aren't black and white. Like he yeah. still has, he can still make decisions that maybe aren't good. You know, he can still be pushed to a point. Like I thought that's what it was showing that like, that this is a good person, but like, he's not perfect. And like, yeah. there's this seed here that even a good person yeah. can be, can you can be used to turn them into something that that, that you wouldn't yeah. think they would be? I also think we have to acknowledge another one of the greatest film quotes that's ever been made from this, where you know at the end where he says you either die oh, yeah. a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. Like what an iconic line! Like so good. I yeah. use that quote all the time. It's so I applicable in, it's, in a lot of like a lot of areas so of life. Good. It's just true in a lot of yes. stuff, right? Like about becoming bitter and bittered about stuff in life yes. or like, yeah. One of my favorite quotes as a parallel is from uh, the sports writer, Bob Ryan, legendary sports writer, Bob Ryan, who said um, familiarity breeds contempt. And I think that's kind of, uh, kind of goes along with that. Like the, the longer, the more familiar you get with something, the more likely you are to um, be dismissive of it in a way. Um, I took a screenshot speaking of quotes and maybe we should do a quote section next time because even you know um, what's it called the last uh, Dark Knight Rises has some great quotes in it too but one of the quotes from Batman Begins that I thought was just absolutely fascinating and and timely was that criminals thrive thrive on the indulgence of society's understanding Mm. and I was like "Mm, that is good and timely yeah yeah um so one thing I do want to mention about the Dark Knight was, and I want to go back because um, Shai mentioned it, <clears throat> and this is one of the most impactful scenes for me as well. And it has, it's not really to do with Batman, but it has to do with our current era. <clears throat> and that was when you had that, those millions of screens and the technology to find everybody everywhere. And Lucius was like, well, as long as you have this technology, like, I don't want to be here because this is, you know, it's unethical, it's, it's immoral, this shouldn't exist, no one person should have all this power. And then Batman's like, well, that's why I'm leaving with you. And then I couldn't help but think of the contrast from that between now what we have with smartphones and tech companies literally having that exact same technology, if not better and more right now on all of the citizens. And they're like, you know, we can't have this technology on 30 million people. And I'm like, shoot, we have it on over a billion today. Yeah. And we're, we're literally have that technology at our fingertips or companies have that technology yeah. at their fingertips, which back in 2008, when this movie came out, the uh, first big smartphone, the iPhone, came out in 2007. And I was like, what an interesting just parallel between that comment, agreeing with him there, and where we really are today as far a as little social commentary, right? A little bit of a, a warning yeah. to the future that, that was obviously not heated. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Clearly. Yeah. <laughs> I just found that fascinating. All right. Uh, I want to get to to my, I think, the thing that was most moving to me about this entire film maybe the entire series is what did you guys think of the death scene of the Rachel death scene in in the middle of the movie? Like that shocked me when I first saw it, like especially knowing it was going to be a trilogy to have the main love interest actually get killed. Like for real, not brought back, Mm -hmm. not, not, Oh, not a, not commissioner Gordon. He was faking it. Like actually murdered like in that way. Like, that was I found that to be super powerful. I was shocked by it. I was saddened by it. Like I even re like I remember the first time I watched it, it really hit me hard. Even rewatching it this time, like I, you know, the thought of like like what if that had been my wife, and I had to like listen to her, you know, and like trying to save her and being tricked into going and saving saving the wrong person, which sounds terrible. Like oh, I saved you on accident. Like, but like. I don't know. I thought that was an incredible scene and it really That's what happened, me. right? The Joker told him that they were at the wrong place on purpose. He flipped him. He flipped him because he knew he knew, again, he knew Batman would be, be the one to get there. And I this one I can see a little bit like like how I'm I'm a little bit with you on this as I think about it through like how could he have had the timing so exact to know that Batman could save Dent but that the other one wouldn't. And like, how could he know he'd be interrogated at that time in mm. order for them to get where yeah, they need to go? Like, that's part of it. That's part of all of it. Yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah, your no. point is like, but 
again, like, is it something where he's, you know, we don't know how far his reach is. Yeah, if he's in not there. interrogated, does he take a crap on the cell floor to bring a guard over to get somebody's yeah. attention and then has the same dialogue or, or yeah. what? Like, what if he had other like, contingencies? Def- yeah. Right. And like, if he has kind of a clock in his head to know, does he say, okay, like, is he kind of like, cause they do kind of chit and chat before he actually gives the information. So is he kind of stalling up until that point to say, this is when I need to reveal it. Cause this is the window where I believe mm-hmm. it. But you're right. I mean, there's a little bit there where you're kind of like, is he really like, know how fast the police but maybe he does maybe based on where the locations are you know one's closer i don't know there's there's a little bit of a gray there but yeah i it still didn't bother me it just made me like i was just very sad when that happened like it's 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 the kind of action like the kind of scenario that i think like is a believable way of turning harvey dent into what he was Yeah, you know like and like the fact that he got all scarred is kind of like a bonus but like the emotion that that and then the convers the last conversation they have is that she says that yes, I will be with you forever yes. and all that stuff. And I'll, like, I'll marry yeah. you. Yeah. 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 I I it was it was very powerful. I think the only the only reason that I still am confused about the whole like he's like, I'm going for Rachel, but then he shows up a dent. And like I think you're right. Like the Joker purposely switched it, but yes, he, he doesn't be. Batman doesn't react at all when he walks in. And that confuses me still a little bit. Like there's no like oh. what? Where's There's Rachel? no like, where's Rachel? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. like you, I would expect with how much he loved Rachel and how, like, like obviously he think he'd realize in that moment, I just need to pull a dent out. But still, that seems a little cold for Batman to not like have a reaction. Um, like, cause we hear the whole exchange from Harvey Dent's conversation. We hear like the door open. We hear like, why are you here? Why did you come for me? But like nothing from Batman. And it's just like, that's always bothered. That's nothing thing that's always bothered me where it's like, Batman just seems so cold throughout the whole thing. The part of me is like, did he know that he was going for Dent somehow? And he made that decision. No, like, I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't feel yeah. like his reaction afterwards holds, holds that up. Yeah. You know, like I think if he had that, it would have been addressed. I feel like it was a trick. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I agree, and, but it just doesn't match up to me. That's just like an area that has never matched up, up for me. Interesting. In that regard. Any thoughts about, and maybe we get this more in the third one, but like the freaking scarecrow just like keep popping up in these movies, almost like a cameo. Where he's it. just like, he just like keeps showing up, but not getting killed or anything. That confused me the first time I watched it. I was like, isn't that the scarecrow? But now he's just, I don't yeah. understand what's going on here. Yeah, I like, totally did. Yeah. I, the first time I watched it, I totally didn't make that connection. Yeah, no, it was oh, this I, time yeah. I did. I was gotcha. like, I don't know. I love yeah. it. I love how like, and I love, I think we should talk about it more next podcast when we get into the Dark Knight Rises and trilogy as a whole, but like, it feels like a trilogy. It like almost more than almost any yeah. trilogy, maybe except like Lord of the Rings, which was shot at the same time. Like the way that the characters carry over the way that like these things, there's like this, like there's a thread throughout the whole, all three movies. And I think it's great. I think it's, it's kind of cool because it's a little bit kind of harkens back to um, like one of Batman's like, classical problems that people have that he doesn't kill people and so he just captures them and locks them up and yet they always escape and so like these like these criminals are constantly getting free and he's fighting the same battles over over i think this is a little bit of a nod to that that like scarecrow just keeps popping up popping up like whereas if batman would have just dealt with him in the beginning like he wouldn't be there to cause trouble and like is there it's, it's always the moral question of batman maybe we can think about this over the over the break and next time when we come back to part two because i know we're about out of time here but like the idea that like is batman culpable when he lets you know he refuses to to use lethal force perhaps on some people who maybe deserve it and then when they get free to cause trouble again and more lives are lost like where's the culpability for batman and maybe not the first time but like maybe like the second time the third time like as these people continue to cause trouble and cost people their lives like at what point does batman have a responsibility to actually like cut the cut off the stem right before i don't know it's it's, it's an, i think it's always thing has been an interesting question on whether batman is actually responsible for the for some of the repercussions of of his choices but we i think that's a little bit deeper than uh than the time we have now because i think we've gone a little bit over not surprising any final thoughts before we wrap it today gentlemen I have one final one final thing that I wanted to mention. Yeah. Like I love the first scene when he shows up 
in the movie. Because another co- thing that shows in Dark Knight is that there's now Batman imposters, like normal people that are trying to like oh, act as yeah. Batman, but they're just vigilantes yeah. and they don't have the technology. So there's a scene at the beginning when you see the Scarecrow, and there's this awesome, there's two awesome scenes in that that I re- lo- really love, and I just want to wrap up my my last comments about it are like there's a scene he has like some kind of like cutting tool on his wrist or whatever to cut through metal and there's a scene where like it malfunctions like it doesn't work as intended he's trying to cut through the side of this van as it's, as the scarecrow's yeah, driving the and it gets caught yeah. in the metal and it's just such a cool scene of like we always see batman's technology working and like everything going flawlessly but there's just a scene where like he got kind of stymied like it didn't work and he has to jump off the van whatever and then like seconds later this van's going down this parking garage and he jumps off the the the, the level of the parking garage and there's this awesome just shot of him landing on top of this van with the cloak and this impact and just i don't know like there's just that movie is full of scenes like that that are just extremely and then the fake experience. batman's like what makes you different than me and he says i'm not wearing hockey pads <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> so then, and then that guy I- dies later yeah. And it's Batman's fault. I think too that like uh, uh, another parallel that is how like he has trouble with the dogs. Like the dogs are all tearing yeah. him up, and then later he has to go loose. He's like, "How's it do against dogs?" <laughs> 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 like it's, but it's a good point. Like it shows that it's always a work in progress. Like he's not yeah. just he's not just got like this perfect set that it's oh, always no. he even... against everything. Yeah, he's like, hey, hey, Lucius, here's my new plans. And he goes, oh, you want to be able to turn your head? He goes, well, it'd be <laughs> backing out of my, make backing out of my driveway a little easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Van, did you have any other final thoughts? Nope. If we have not. more, obviously we can continue with Batman be, uh, The Dark Knight. I do want to do that. Next time, because we maybe didn't get to everything there. And then we'll have Dark Knight Rises and kind of as a whole. But uh, if you have any thoughts about the Batman trilogy, about the NHL, about Final Fantasy 11, or about the podcast in general, we would love to hear from you. We have our uh, contact information is as follows. We're on Twitter at focus target. We're on YouTube focus target podcast. That's where all of our previous episodes, some of the streaming stuff we've done. We haven't done a lot of streaming lately. I don't think maybe shy has, I know I haven't. Um, we are, uh, but all that can be found on YouTube. We have twitch.tv backslash focus target podcast. That's where we're broadcasting live today. And of course, the best way to reach us directly is our email focus target podcast at gmail.com. So thanks for being with us for episode 104 of the focus target podcast. I am your host, Smiley. This is Shy. And I'm Dan. As always, cover Morgan's. We're out.